Before we get started with the show, we wanted to draw your attention to our crowdfunding page on Patreon. If you've been enjoying Always Take Notes, please do consider supporting us there. It helps us to keep the podcast going. If you support us on Patreon, you can get a great selection of rewards, including a shout out on the show and a selection of successful magazine pitches. If you pledge $10 a month, you get a free two month trial to Otter worth $26 alongside the other rewards. Otter offers automated transcription and live note taking for in-person and virtual meetings. I found it to be a huge help when organizing interview material. You also get access to a series of mini episodes from previous guests on the show in which they answer three revealing questions. The latest episode features William Boyd. Here's a snippet. I would urge people to, or who want to write, to, to cultivate is stamina. Um, people forget how long it takes to write things. And I think it's important to remember that a certain doggedness and a certain um, relentlessness is important in the writing life. And if you haven't got that stamina in you. Hello and welcome to Always Take Notes. In this episode, Rachel and I spoke with novelist and nonfiction writer Amanata Fauna. We spoke with Amanata about The Devil That Danced on the Water, her memoir about her father's execution in Sierra Leone, the similarities between creative nonfiction and fiction, and her determination to be on a firm financial footing. It's a great episode, and we hope you enjoy it. Welcome, Aminata, to Always Take Notes. It's brilliant to have you on the show. I wondered if we could start with The Window Seat, your new collection of essays. Um, how were the entries chosen? Because as I understand, it's a mix of some republished work and some, some new essays. Yeah, most of, the, um, most of the essays in The Window Seat um, had already been published. Um, we had to make, me and my editor, as John Freeman mentioned in the acknowledgements, had to make two um, <clears throat> decisions. The first one, what was the book, which essays were going in, right? So I had a, a over 10 years, I'd published a, a good many essays, um, and some of them were about the art of writing, um, and some of them were about life. And we decided this was going to be a book about life. So <laughs> the ones that dealt with, I don't know, writing memoir or, you know, uh, uh, were kept out of it. We chose all the ones that were really about being in the world. And then as the collection began to come together, I began to write things specially for it. When I saw some, some were rewrites like I had written about insomnia before, and I decided to uh, tackle the subject matter again, um, you know, years later. And other, other um, essays were brand new. For example, the um, title essay, The Window Seat, was brand new. Um, I wrote that for the collection because it seemed to me to embody the spirit of the collection. And why did you feel that now was the time to release non-fiction after publishing a number of novels? There are a couple of reasons. One is I tend to use essays as a sort of palate cleanser between novels. I find it very hard not to write. Um, so, But a novel takes so much out of you that going from one novel straight into the next novel is normally not possible. Also, novels take a long time, for me anyway. They take quite a lot of time to germinate. Um, so I tended to do a bit of non-fiction in between essays, in between novels, and over time that gave me uh, uh, the beginnings of a collection. The other thing I would say is this, that the novels all follow each other in a particular kind of thought process. And I'd reached the end of that thought process. I'd really been writing about civil conflict and trauma for 20 years, and I'd got to the end of that arc. Um, so the window seat seemed a good project for now before the next big project. And you've said in previous interviews that the writer of creative nonfiction and the writer of fiction have much in common. Could you sort of elucidate on that a little more? Well, I think when I think of nonfiction, um, I mean, there are various different kinds, of course. An essay can be ruminative, it could be um, argumentative, you know, it could be... But, um, you know, I tend to think of creative nonfiction as a found story. So if you think about Picasso's work, and I sometimes use this when I'm teaching a class, if you think about Picasso's bulls, which he painted in, and produced in so many different ways, you know, the, the painting of a bull or, or a line drawing of a bull. But then there's another bull, which is 
it's a, a bicycle seat and handlebars, you see. He just put the handlebars above the bicycle seat, uh, uh, depicted in that way a bull. So I think of non-fiction, creative non-fiction, as a found story. Right? You've got most of the elements already there. You've got a character. You've got a setting. You've got a story with an arc, emotional, but also an arc, which is... Um, in terms of an essay, probably something else, philosophical, something that you might um, wish to contemplate uh, more deeply. Um, and so actually you're using much of the same uh, craft mechanisms. You're going to use dialogue, you're going to use description, you're going to use characterization, you know, and, and you're going to follow that up. Now, not every essay in the collection, or indeed every essay written by an author, does that. But broadly speaking, if you're telling a non-fiction story, that's what you're doing. I mean, if your essay is a polemic, it's going to be different again. <laughs> but if you're telling a non-fiction story, you're pretty much using most of the elements of, of fiction. Would it be fair to say, though, that, that fiction is your preferred medium? We found this, this quote, which you said that literature is about nuance and understanding the intricacies of life. Journalism prefers simplicity, even at the price of reductionism. Could you unpack that a bit? Well, I take journalism out of the equation because I don't consider journalism to be creative non-fiction. Journalism is its own brand. Uh, you know, when I was a journalist and what I found frustrating about being a journalist, as I was for the BBC for 10 years, was they lit that reductionism. You could take nothing. You could expect nothing from your audience. Right, absolutely nothing. Um, information was delivered in, a, in the most basic form. You weren't asking people to think very deeply. You are asking them just to receive the facts as you gave them. But also, you know, we, we were, all of us, homogenised into one particular voice. And it, there was always a sort of irony in my position. I mean, think about W.E.B. Du Bois's double consciousness. You know, there I was, uh, belonging to a minority and, you know, um, and yet being obliged to speak as though I belonged to the majority, uh, as though I, you know, I was a member of, the, uh, of, of white Middle England. Uh, and that really jarred for me. Um, so I, you know, I, I was very happy when I left journalism. I have said before, and I'll say it again, that the two happiest days of my career in journalism was when I joined the BBC and when I left. Uh, Literary writing, be it fiction or non-fiction, is very different. Uh, it's very different indeed. Um, so when we're comparing those two things, fiction and literary, you know, any kind of literary writing, these things have more in common. That remark that you've just quoted was really about journalism and my disappointments with journalism. Could we linger on your disappointments with journalism just for a little bit longer? Um, you joined the BBC in the late uh, 1980s. How did you get that start there? I did an a, uh, audition. Uh, they were looking for a presenter. So I was writing at that point, I was writing for magazines and newspapers, and there was a show that was looking for a presenter. I, I just got a call saying, would I come do a screen test? Um, I think that's how it started. I was working for CNN at the time, but uh, you know, I was just, just, just doing a, a back room job and freelancing on the side. I had a column in one of those free magazines that you get on the tube called, um, God, what was it called now? Uh, it'll come to me. Wow, it actually shows how old I'm getting. I can't even remember what this magazine was called, but it meant that I had a very high profile because, of course, everyone took the tube in the morning and everyone picked up a magazine. And um, so there it was. Uh, it was Miss London. So, um, I had quite a high profile, and I just got a call saying, you know, they were looking for presenters for the show, but I come and give it a go. And I didn't get the first position that I applied, I auditioned for, but I got the second one, which was reporting on uh, as a youth kind of affairs program. And then during this this ten years that you had there, what what kind of stuff were you doing, and what was the process at, at that time in in the organisation of of putting ideas forward and, and getting them made and things like that. Uh, what did I do? I mean, I started off in current affairs and I moved into arts. I worked for The Late Show, which you may or may not remember. Um, <clears throat> and I even did stints in the newsroom. I mean, at that point, if you were a reporter, they tried you out in various different places, but also you would apply to programmes you were interested in. 
But everybody was looking for that on-screen talent. So, you know, the late show, I was working on a current affairs program, and at you know, some point the late show gave me a call and said, do you want to come and work with us? Um, but the, the way in which you got ideas on air as a reporter or a producer, and actually there came a time when reporters also produced their own work. So when I started working there, I, I worked with a team, um, but the way in which the, um, the whole industry changed and the way in which the technology changed meant that we mostly um, went out on our own with a cameraman and eventually actually with the camera. Um, and you know, I was actually quite happy directing, although it's hard to self-direct. But uh, it was pretty much the same whether you were working on a news programme or working on an arts programme, whether you were working on three minutes or you know, three one-hour episodes, you had to go to your editor, you had to pitch the idea. The pitching process was extremely rigorous. There'd usually be an ideas meeting at which it was debated. And that would happen if you were in, in, in news, for example, where I spent a couple of years, that would happen every morning. Um, on a weekly show, it would happen once a week, you know, and you know, on a, on a longer form, it might happen less than that. But it was a pretty rigorous process. And you would ask, be asked to put in a written uh, summary of it. And then, you know, it either flew or it didn't. But you had to be able to defend your idea very, very strongly. Um, so what did I do? I mean, I, I, did, I did all the country I did the programs, I did a lot of arts, I did some radio, and actually, until I left to live in America, I, you know, I did stand in for Tom Sutcliffe on Saturday Review occasionally, or uh, Marianne Frostrup on her book program. Um, and I also, I suppose, in the, my time in TV, actually the films that I remember most and was most proud of were the ones that I made, the documentaries I made in on the African continent, of which the last one was The Lost Libraries of Timbuktu. And what was the research process like for those? Obviously, you must have had to do some before you pitched it, but then once the idea had been commissioned, how much work went into it? Was it as you went along when you were filming? No, you researched it heavily. I mean, much to the nth degree before you pick up a camera because film is an expensive process. Getting a crew out there, you know, when, when I, I made a, the first full length documentary I actually made myself was a documentary on African art, which I made in 1995. It was a one hour program. So we, we filmed it in the United States and in Britain. And we made a trip to Mali, filmed all the way through Mali from um, Bamako, Mopti, um, to Timbuktu. And, you know, that is a huge amount of money. And that's actually what, I was very young, so it was unnerving, you know, to be in charge of a three-man crew and, you know, a budget of 100,000. So uh, by the time you hit the ground filming, you know every shot that you are looking for. And, of course, you have to... Um, You've got to be flexible. Either things fall down, people, you know, things collapse, it rains, <laughs> um, or you find something better. So, you know, you have to be flexible when you're out there, but at the same time, you cannot afford to waste a minute. So, you know, as soon as you get off the plane, that camera turns on and pretty much doesn't turn off again. And they were long and exhausting days. I remember a cousin of mine, I was making a a documentary in Sierra Leone, and one of my cousins came to help us with um, to act as a fixer, you know. And at the end of it, I remember him sitting down in the evening and saying, "Oh my God," he said, "When you film the day, you feel like you've walked a hundred miles." <laughs> uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a pretty exhausting job. It's no, it's no surprise it's a young person's game, isn't it? Could you tell us now about the, the gestation and kind of origin of The Devil That Danced on the Water, how the idea first came to you and then you know, what it was, how you, how you pitched it in the book and then going out to Sierra Leone at that period of, towards the end of the Civil War and things. How, how, how that became what it became. The idea developed, and this is going back a way, but the idea really came to fruition when I was at the BBC, with all my disappointments about journalism. Um, and I was working in the newsroom when 
at when the war really sort of hit fever pitch. Um, and I was appalled, appalled at the reporting. I mean, and I don't mean the BBC, I'm not singling the BBC out specifically because actually the BBC was doing a not bad job and also were the reporters who were covering it were very happy. The foreign correspondents were very happy to, you know, pick my brains, you know, but whether it was about pronunciation or the geography of the country, um, but it was the way that the war was generally reported, right, throughout the British media. And don't forget, um, Simon and Rachel, that the contemporaneous war at that time was the former Yugoslavia. So if you go back and you look at the press cuttings or you look at the news reports out of those two wars, there is the former Yugoslavia being reported in every political detail, right? You know, the Bosnian Serbs, the Croats, the, the um, what are the Chetniks, you know, every single format between Milosevic and everybody else is, is, is followed, right? You get to Sierra Leone, and what you get is reporting which effectively says, oh, the blacks are at it again, right? And it was described as an ethnic war. I mean, I think the thing that, you know, of the many indign indignations that I felt at that time, Sierra Leone being reported as an ethnic conflict when it wasn't, right? In fact, they didn't use the word ethnic, they used the word tribal, of course. Uh, but when it comes to the former Yugoslavia, they come up with this lovely term, ethnic cleansing, for what is a tribal war. Um, so I was getting really, really frustrated. And I thought a long time about my father's story and a long time about what I knew and, and what I was gradually discovering. And what had not come to me at that point was the fall. Right? I mean, uh, throughout those years, what hadn't come to me was the fall. And I kept thinking, should I write it as fiction? But every time I tried to write it as fiction, the story kept bursting through. And I, and I think that, you know, there's simply some stories that have to be told as they are. That's what I mean by it's a real story, right? There, there was no reason to disguise any of it. So um, eventually the form came to me and I realised this is, I can write this as a memoir. And there are... You know, you can't move now for bumping into a memoir, but uh, at the time there were very few memoirs around. And I had read uh, Jung Chang's Wild Swans, and I had read Every Secret Thing by Gillian Slogan. And it was really reading those two books that made me think, this is, I can use this form, I can tell it as a personal memoir. And I pretty much quit the BBC overnight to do it. Um, I... I had an agent, technically, because I had written a book before. Um, so I went to my agent and I said, um, you know, this is what I want to write. And I wrote a proposal, I think. Yeah, I wrote a proposal. I must have written a proposal. And it was pitched and commissioned. And, I, you know, I, and I went ahead with it. So at that time, I, was, I, I left the BBC pretty much overnight. Uh, actually, overnight. I left it with him. You know, I, did, I had a contract. I was just about to sign. No, I had just signed another contract. I just went ahead with my thought, this is a terrible mistake. There's just no way I can carry on working there. And so I told my husband, you know, I have to leave the BBC now. <laughs> so I went in the next day. And, uh, I had a nice guy who was... Who, uh, was the executive in charge of all the reporters, the, the current affairs, on screen talent. And I went to him and I said, you know what, well, I have made a mistake and I shouldn't have signed that contract. And I don't think it's going to hold me to it. And he said, no. Um, and he said, so when do you want to leave? You know, in two months. And I said, no. And he said, end of the month. And I said, no. And he went, end of the week? And I went, mm. and he went, end of the day? Uh, <laughs> and in the end, I think we agreed two weeks notice, but uh, I'd have left at the end of the day. I mean, I was done. I still see him, my guy. But, uh, you should have got end of the hour. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So four mi hour, four minutes end time. Of <laughs> end of the meeting. Yeah. But I mean, <laughs> uh, and I left and I, and I began work on The Devil the Darts on the Water and it consumed me for two years. Uh, actually, I'm amazed I wrote it in that short time, but it was so 
the urgency that I felt about it. Um, and I made two long trips to Sierra Leone in 2000. Well, must one, what was the beginning of 2000? One must have been thereafter. But um, I went back, uh, or maybe one was 1999, but anyway, I went back just after the invasion of Freetown. Um, and, and it was an extraordinary feeling because, uh, you know, I was walking into a, a battle zone and um, people were visibly, very, very visibly still, uh, I'm going to use the word shell-shocked, not traumatised. Um, and the reason is, is, I have very strong feelings about the use of the word traumatised, which we could talk about, but I'd say it, on reflection that they were, in inverted commas, shell-shocked because they had just come out of the invasion and they were reeling from it. Uh, but most of those people would go on to recover themselves, uh, and a few would go on to um, suffer what we call, or what the mental health is, um, professionals call trauma. But, you know, trauma is something that manifests itself later. So um, people were really visibly really, um, and... At first, it felt strange to be there sort of picking over this story that was 25 years old. And I knew what the significance was, but, you know, it still felt a little bit um, a sort of you know, disembodied experience. But actually, what I found was that everyone I spoke to was so desperate to understand how we had reached that point. It was so important for them to know how did we come to a place where we were killing each other, that people were extremely keen to engage um, and take part. And even people who didn't necessarily come out of the story that well were willing to talk to me. I'd say two things um, about them in particular. Uh, um, actually, a few years later, you know, they were rewriting their narratives and looking for exculpatory um, and their stories excluded about what they had or hadn't done. And that really was the book that, that was the understanding that prompted the memory of love, how people, you know, when they look back over history and then they found they're on the wrong side of it, they start rewriting their narratives. Um, but the other thing that had happened, which was very important, was that a letter that my father had written, his last letter that he had written to the nation when he was in prison had come to light. He'd written it on the eve of his execution. Um, so the story is that Shekhar Stevens, the then dictator, had supplied all of the condemned men with paper and pen. And he had said that they could write a plea for their lives to him. And of course, uh, you know, my father knew that that would not be, you know, that would not be the case. Stevens was going to kill him anyway, right? So what he did was he wrote a letter to the nation and there was a young journalist who was worked for a state newspaper. All the newspapers were state newspapers by then, state control. So this young journalist had been sent in to interview the condemned men on the eve of their death. Presumably, I hope to again be getting some kind of deathbed, in inverted commas, confession or some sort of debasement, some kind of... But what was unknown to the authorities at the time that was that he had once been a member of the UDP, which was the uh, Democratic Party my father had founded and which had been banned and he'd been imprisoned. And the first time he was a prisoner of conscience for three years between 70 and 73. So unbeknownst to the authorities, this young man had been a member of the UDP. So my father gave him a letter and the young man hid it. Uh, until he wasn't a young man anymore. He hid it for 25 years. And it came to life in 2000 after he died and his widow found it and she sent it to a newspaper. And of course he hid it. You know, there was nothing, I suppose he could have got it out of the country maybe, but there was nothing he could have done with it at the time. He couldn't publish it, you know, couldn't afford to give it to anybody or reveal its existence. Um, but his wife saw the significance of it and sent it to a newspaper and it was published. And even my family didn't know it existed at that time. In the latter, my father talked about the fact that if Sierra Leone carried on its current trajectory, 
um, the country would end in war, right? That we, we would lose the authority of the rule of law and we would end in war. So a lot of people read that letter and it was, you know, somebody was speaking from the grave and everything he said had, had come about. So for all these reasons, um, I found everybody in Sierra Leone that I wanted to talk to, you know, in, in a place where they actually wanted to have those conversations and figure something out. And of course, it made, you know, if uh, it's always, it's, you know, it's always something when you've, you, you've lived with a, a story and then, you know, at what point do different parts of the story come together? At what point does your understanding of it come together? At what point do you find out which parts of the story and make all the linkages? It's sometimes a little bit hard to, um, you know, to, to recall all of that. But what I do recall very clearly was knowing once I read the letter that that was, you know, that was everything we needed, right? And everything I needed as a writer, it was the end of the, of the story. In terms of the, you were saying the way the war was perceived in, by the British media in the 90s, and, and particularly the, this use of this language of ethnic or, or tribal, I mean, did you think that, that, that there was not an ethnic dimension in Sierra Leonean politics? Or, you know, because certainly when I was there, the, you know, the Timney Mende or Limba Mende dimension was, was significant and, and certainly seemed in some ways more so than, a, than an ideological differentiation between sides. There wasn't in the war, though. Right, there wasn't in the war any tribal element. And if you talk to anyone who was witness to the battles or the fighting, they recalled hearing Liberian voices, they recalled hearing Timney, Limba, Mende, Creole, they recalled hearing Burkinabe uh, uh, voices, you know, they, it was an, it wasn't, what would it say, it was a regional conflict. But it certainly was not Timney versus Mende versus Limba, you know, whatever the politics reflect. And, you know, ask any politician to stop appealing to their base, as we know, whichever country we're in, you know, good luck with that. Um, but in terms of the conflict, no, there was not a tribal element to it. Except insofar as, you know, at some point the Kamajors came on board and, you know, fought under their own banner, but they were not fighting the Timney, they were fighting the rebels. And the rebels came from every, every group. The one thing the rebels had in common with each other, actually, was that they were almost universally people who had very little to lose and disenfranchised. You know, they, they had no job, no future, no anything. And so, um, you know, the RUF had little difficulty recruiting them, but it recruited them from wherever they came. You said that um, the writing of it was actually quite swift. You surprised yourself with how quickly it, it kind of went, despite the kind of painful personal material. Was that because once you had that letter, you knew exactly what you wanted to say? No, no, because the letter came along after I'd begun work on the book. No, I, it just was extremely urgent, you know, for the sake of my country, for the sake of my family, and for the sake of myself. You know, the time had come and it, and it really needed to be written. And how did the, the research work linguistically? Did you, had you grown up speaking Creole or and did you speak any other Sierra Leonean languages? Or how were you, did you need to use interpreters or were you able to? Uh... No, I didn't. I didn't. I mean, for, for some of the chimney, yes, I did need to use interpreters. But I mean, most of the interviews were done in English. Uh, my Creole was good enough. I mean, I understand it perfectly, but because I, we left, we were obliged to leave for a period of my childhood. From the age of six to nine, my spoken career is not very good, but my I can understand career perfectly. So and so usually, you know, if somebody was a career speaker, I might just ask a question in English and they'd answer the career, which is fine. Um, for the Timney interviews, I used uh, my cousin as an interpreter, um, but those were mostly people at village level who had seen, you know, they were interviews about very specific things that they may or might have seen. There weren't that many uh, Timney interviews. But, you know, I, I mean, I preferred to do the interviews in English because it, it was useful to distance myself from the subject matter as far as the interviewees were concerned so that they didn't, so that they didn't, you know, sit there concerned about the fact that they were talking to Dr. Fawn's daughter. It just helped make that slight separation, which worked very well, actually. I look a bit different from them, I sound a bit different, I dress a bit different, you know. And so people would pretty much soon forget that I was his daughter. <laughs> 
um, or at least it, it would not be uppermost in their mind. Message from our sponsor, Vitsu. Marta's story. If only each shelf could talk, reflected Marta, a Vitsu customer since 2004. Her shelving system began modestly and has grown over the years. It travelled with her from London to Valencia and now Amsterdam. This is the fifth time Marta has bought from Vitsu. Every time she speaks with her personal Vitsu planner, Robin, who reorganised her bookshelves to fit her Spanish walls and her Dutch hoose. He even sent her extra packaging to protect her shelves with each move. You might say that their relationship has become a friendship over the years. Marta knows she is valued and trusts the advice Robin gives. If your shelves could talk, what would they say? Vitsu's 606 Universal Shelving System is a modular, adaptable kit of parts. It can form the perfect home for your books and even the desk from which to write one. Visit vitsu.com, V-I-T-S-O-E.com or request a free brochure via email at vitsu.com by quoting ATN 606. Vitsu, makers of long living furniture by Dieter Rams. And how do you find your uh, interview subjects generally? I read with Ancestor Stones, the novel that you wrote after your memoir, you visited older women because, you know, the information about their lives was not the kind of stuff that you could read in libraries or on the internet. How did you, how do you find the people that will enrich or inform your stories? I mean, how literally do I track them down? Yeah. <laughs> we, lo- we love the specifics. Oh, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, with, the, with those women, it was word of mouth. So I started with my stepmother, because she's one of my greatest collaborators. <laughs> and she was for that book, uh, a fantastic uh, collaborator. So I started with her and, and, you know, it was word of mouth. And uh, people were just coming forward saying, I'll talk to you, I'll talk to you, I'll talk to you. I mean, people were delighted to talk about themselves. They are delighted to talk about themselves. Um, you know, I went, I, I went to a, a sports bar here in Virginia just a week ago. My husband was watching soccer and he, I sat down and actually I, it was over. Um, and I, but he'd been talking to a couple and I spoke to the woman and about 10 minutes later, she said, I don't know why I'm telling you all this. I haven't told most people in my life these things. And my husband was saying, yeah, I didn't know a lot of that. And, uh, you know, people like to talk about themselves. And if you, you know, I guess over the years, I've learned to ask questions in a particular way that elicits information. Um, but you know, I've never really found I had a big problem with it. But other books... If I need professionals, if I, you know, if, I, if it requires a professional, as opposed to people sharing their life stories with me, like happiness, uh, which featured you know, an awful lot of wildlife and a character who's a wildlife biologist. I was reading a book called Coyote at the Kitchen Door when I was living in Massachusetts. Uh, and then I literally read the acknowledgements and I realised they also lived uh, two hours away from me. And I e- found his email online and said, will you meet me and talk to me? And, you know, I'll buy you lunch. And he always said afterwards, he said, because he said he always described himself as kind of a grumpy man, but he said the email was so nice. And, uh, you know, he wanted to talk about what he did. And so off we went, we had lunch. He ended up, you know, being my greatest resource for the book. He and his wife taught me how to track, track coyotes. They taught me, you know, all about the flora and fauna of, of Western Massachusetts, where my parts of my book were set. And they taught me about human animal um, coexistence. You know, they were huge. They were a huge part of it. And, you know, he has an acknowledgement both in that book and also in, uh, in uh, The Window Seat, which we've mentioned in the last essay in The Window Seat, you know, came very much out of my conversations with him. The essay called Wilder Things, which is about um, urban wildlife. So, yeah, word of mouth, if it's just tell me, tell me about yourself and your life. And if it's a professional, I usually find them in a way that journalists do well. But I think people are much, much happier to talk to writers than they are to journalists. People don't trust journalists, but they trust writers much more. And I think the reason for that is because writers, we're writing in our own voice. You know, we're writing what we see and hear. We're not being channeled through 
uh, an organisation with its own agenda that just people feel there's a greater integrity about a writer, be it a novelist or, or a non-fiction writer. With the memoir and then the subsequent novels, were you able to, to build up a readership in Sierra Leone at that time, given the, the sort of post-war damage to infrastructure and, and stuff like that? Were your books available in Sierra Leone? Well, actually, the difficulty with my building up my Sierra Leonean readership has been far more to do with the levels of um, literacy in that country than anything else. I mean, yeah, we don't, or at that time, we didn't have a bookshop, and then there was one. Um, what I did was I gave, uh, I gifted 50 copies of the book to the British Council and 50 copies of the book to the British Embassy. No, the embassy bought them. I gave 50 copies of the book to the British Council and I gave 50 copies of the book to Furabe and to um, uh, Njala University. So they were put in the libraries. And the British Council told me that um, each copy of the book, of The Devil That Dots on the Water, each copy was out and had a wait list of 50 on it. So, and I went, I gave a lot of lectures, and the lectures were packed. Um, happily, The Devil That Dots on the Water was Book of the Week on Radio 4, which also went out in the World Service. A lot of people heard it on the radio. But uh, literacy is my greatest hurdle. And so I did hear of reading groups whereby one person, a literate person, would read the book out loud and they would read a chapter a day and people would come and listen to each chapter being read. And then when he got to the end, uh, the person who told me this particular story, who was running one of the reading groups, when he got to the end, he'd just begin again at the beginning and people would come in at whatever point <laughs> and follow it. So it hasn't. It has not been especially easy to build up a Serenian readership. But you know, I, I used to sell my books. You probably remember Balmaya. I used to sell my books through Balmaya Restaurant and, uh, and and through the bookshop that was there, and you know, in as many ways as possible. But it's not literacy has been my biggest problem, actually, more so than distribution. I think um, now I notice people who are getting in touch with me in Sierra Leone trying to buy books. The other, the other problem, of course, is the amount of books cost. You know, there's no way the average person is only able to spend 18 or 20 pounds on a book. I think what's really helped is the advent of electronic books because most families will have invested in, even poorer families will have invested in a tablet or some kind of electronic gadget. Um, and then they can download um, and, and ebooks are so much cheaper, of course. I hope you'll forgive another question about the kind of back to basics of your craft, but our listeners love it. Um, in terms of where you get your ideas from, I read that um, for Elias Cole in The Memory of Love, that kind of idea for that character was spr sprung out of a conversation you had with a friend about her father uh, in Ar Argentina's Dirty War. Um, in general, when you're sort of listening and reading things, what is it that you're looking for when you think that might make the seed of a character or a plot point or anything else that goes into a book? I'm usually never looking. <laughs> I'm usually never looking. Or at least I'm not consciously looking in the sense that I'm a writer and therefore I'm always alert to things. And so when my friend told me that story about her father in Argentina, um, which was essentially that, you know, she'd begun to suspect her father of being complicit with the regime, even though he was a professor at the university and not apparently directly linked, because of a couple of things that had happened in her childhood, but mostly because he had had such a successful career. And in Argentina at that time, it was, remar it was a remarkable achievement to, you know, have really skated through without any political... Um, I don't know, involvement or repercussions. So she began to wonder about him. And I remember at one point she just said, how can it be so? How can it be so? And she was convinced ultimately by the time he died that he had been complicit with the regime. But, um, you know, what, what I find is usually what happens is I come across something and then later on, I realise I'm still thinking about it. And then later on, I realise I'm still thinking about it. And then later on, I realise I'm still thinking about it. So that conversation with that friend 
took place around the year 2000. I know that because I was um, working on my book on the devil that danced on the water. And, I, I, and it came out of a conversation where I told her that I was working on the devil that danced on the water. Right. Now, I didn't start working on A Memory of Love until about 2007, six, seven, seven. Um, so, you know, it sort of percolated with me for all those years. And I remember, you know, I, I can remember, I came across somebody in Sierra Leone talking about their father who said something rather similar and was very ashamed of her father for his lack of action. And so that, you know, that gave another layer to it. And I really started thinking about this. I've been asked so many times the question, you know, how do you feel about your father giving his life for this? You know, do you wish he hadn't? Um, did he realise the risk? And then I thought, but what if you asked me the question, how do you feel about a father who did nothing? Right? How would you feel about a father who betrayed his country and his children and their future? How would you feel about that? And that to me is a greater a greater um, struggle, you know, to, to live knowing that your parents didn't have the courage to protect your future, you know, that they were more interested in their present than in your future. So um, that's what eventually led to the memory of love. But, you know, it takes, it's very, very, it takes a long time for me, you know, it doesn't... Just like I see something, I have an idea, and off I go. It takes, you know, different elements come together. And then you have to figure out, how am I going to tell this story, right? And, um, you know, I had the idea of sort of more or less a kind of deathbed confession. But what I wanted was, I wanted a listener. And the idea that the listener would be Adrian Lockhart, who was a British psychologist. Um, Adrian came to me for two reasons. One is I created him in the previous book, so he actually exists in Ancestor Stones as a minor character. Secondly, he's a psychologist. So he is somebody who's in a position to be able to figure out, should be, right, in a position to figure out if somebody is lying or lying to themselves. Okay. Um, but thirdly, I wanted it to be an outsider, right? Couldn't it be somebody, Sarah Leonian, who knew the country, knew the past, and was in a position to judge. It had to be somebody with you know, who was sort of fairly, um, you know, ostensibly neutral about it, who would eventually have to make a decision. And I also, at that time, had really begun to play with the idea of reversing the gaze. You know, well, well the, first of all, there's the, the good old trope of the white man in Africa story, which we know so many in Heart of Darkness is the best known. But, you know, I come to a point where I suddenly thought, you know what? Just about every book I ever read, either contemporary or um, classic, is a rewriting of Heart of Darkness. Right? If it's written by a Westerner, it's always white man goes to Africa, bad things happen, white man leaves. So I wanted to play with that trope that uh, you know, a white man goes to Africa and um, looks at the country, but then actually, you know, the country looks back at him. So you know, there's the character of Adrian Lockhart, and then there's the character of Kai. Mansory. So you, you know, you're the beginning, the reader sees the country in Elias Cole through Adrian Lockhart's eyes. But then at some point the gaze flips around, turns around, and we start seeing Adrian Lockhart through Kai Mansory's eyes. And the book has an elliptic shape, so it starts with Adrian Lockhart and then and, and uh, um, Elias Cole. And then they fade out, and the story belongs to um, Kai Mansare at the end. And of course, Kai Mansare toys with leaving the country uh, because he is suffering from his own after effects of the war, mental after effects of the war. Ultimately, chooses to remain and chooses um, to raise a child in the country. Uh, so, the sort of opposite of blood diamonds, where everybody flees. <laughs> so I wanted people to stay in Sierra Leone, and I'm um, sorry, that was a bit of a spoiler for the end, but, you know, there's a whole, a whole lot happens before that. 
Uh, but I very much wanted people to choose to stay because most people do choose to stay and the focus of contemporary fiction has been so much on migration. But actually, you know, most people stay. My stepmother left Sierra Leone as a refugee and then went back. And I remember when I had to call, um, uh, you know, the, the, the British authorities to get her passport back. They said, why does she want her passport? Because she knew she'd come and had to claim asylum after the first invasion of Freetown in 1997. Um, she and her husband were um, heavily threatened by the mobs and they had to go into hiding and eventually got out of the country and got to England on a, on a, a ship and a flight. Um, and she stayed in England for a year and she you know, eventually wanted to go home. And uh, so when I rang up to try and get her passport back, I was saying, why did she want her passport back? I said, because she wants to go home. <laughs> and I was like, what? You know, but actually most people, you know, most people do stay in that country. So it's, it's been a theme that I've been very interested in. Um, people who stay and people who go, and why they go and why they stay. But in the context of war, you know, and in the context of developing countries, I wanted to, you know, leave, um, leave the story in the country, not take the story out of the country. It wasn't just going to be a backdrop for somebody else's story. So another question that we always ask novelists on the show is, in terms of their process, whether they're, the terms we often hear are plotter or plunger, so whether they're someone who has worked out the entire course of their novel, uh, be that in post-it notes or you know, a, plan on, a plan on the wall before they get going, or whether they just dive in and, and kind of follow where it takes them, or, or somewhere between those two poles. And where do you find yourself on that? Continue. I'm somewhere in between those two poles. I find it impossible to plot out uh, a whole book before I write it. It's probably the reason I can't play chess. I just can't. And my books are very intricate and, intricate, in, uh, intricate and have, um, you know, lots of elements and, and lots of plot layers. So I just couldn't do that. But it is somewhere in between. I usually really know how significant sections of it are going and when I hit one of those it's wonderful um but then there'll be times when I'm not really sure how it's going to work out I usually have an idea what the ending I want the ending to look like um it doesn't always work that way but it more or less you know I usually know pretty well what I'm writing towards but I think to plot it all out I mean, there are you know there are plot driven writers and there are people who write thrillers and they write murder mysteries and that kind of thing. But I think it's quite hard if you write literary fiction to be uh, to have your plot laid out before you start, unless it's an extremely simple one. But if you if if you write um, you know genre, then you would have to have your plot deeply considered before you start. With it. I think especially with something like a murder mystery, otherwise it could be a bit sort of limp. Yeah, messy. Yeah. Exactly. Um, <laughs> I wondered if we could talk now a little bit about your kind of views of authors and appropriation. Um, you, oh, well, no. <laughs> I was interested to see your um, post on Facebook uh, about the sort of new orthodoxy that uh, writers must only set stories within their own country uh, of origin or nationality. Or, yeah. Um, and that that question elicited really thoughtful, interesting responses from writers such as Salman Rushdie. Um, yeah. Could you tell us a little bit more about your feelings on the novelist's responsibility to quote unquote authenticity and their own and sort of fictionalizing their own experiences? I mean, that thread eventually became an essay for The Guardian called Don't Judge a Book by its Author. Um, what I think is this I think write what you want, right? Fiction is an imaginative art. Right? And I have said to people, if I could only write characters like me, there would be a myriad middle-aged, mixed-race women running around my books, falling in love with each other, killing each other, plotting against each other, I don't know, you know, having each other's children. There's, you know, you can't write a book where everybody in it is like you. You cannot, right? You have to have something beyond that. Um, and what frustrates me so much about the present orthodoxy, and it's a generational orthodoxy by people who probably themselves have not fought to get out of the pigeonhole. You know, I spent a lot of time being pigeonholed. I fought very hard to get out of the pigeonhole. 
So I am furious that there is a generation that want to stick me back in the pigeonhole, right? I don't want to set all my books in Sierra Leone or all my books in Scotland, right? Or, you know, so um, I'm really frustrated about it uh, from that point of view. And I, I say to my young students, who by and large actually don't think like this, but I say to my young students, you know, I get as angry as anybody else when I come across a book in which, let's say, all the characters of colour are complete stereotypes, all, all the women are one-dimensional. I was reading a book by a writer who I know personally and like, and when I was a third of the way through the book and the only black character in the book was a woman who was a prostitute, I thought, right, you know what, I've given you enough time to redeem this, but I'm not carrying on with your book. You know, throw it down, put it down. But the idea that we start saying it cannot be done, and if you don't like it being done, then read non-fiction. It is very, very easy, right? You don't have to read fiction. No one's asking you to do it. Um, but do I think, of course I think the writers have a responsibility to do it well, right? They have a responsibility to do it well and to actually walk the walk and think what it is like to be that character and not use them as ciphers and not use them just to show another character's liberalism or his erection or whatever it is, you know, that they, they want to, um, you know, have a woman or a person of colour in their book. Well, think about it more deeply. Do your best. But the idea that we don't do it, it's terrible. The other thing that we always ask guests on the show about is about money and how it's interfaced with their writing lives. So be as candid or as guarded as you, as you want to. But for you, with your, you know, your, your career over the past 20 years, how have you made it work? And how does your income split between teaching, between journalism, between novels, non-fiction, non-fiction like that? When I first began to write, I was only one of two writers that I could think of who didn't have a private Absolutely everybody had either a trust fund or, more likely, um, they, because it's usually the most privileged, most likely they had some major helper, like their parents had helped them buy the house, for example. Um, or they were married to somebody rich, which I wasn't. Uh, so that's, that was pretty much how it started. I was very fortunate to begin to write in the early 2000s when, uh, when advances were significant. So I did get pretty good advances. Not so much for The Devil, The Darts on the Water, which was my first book, but for my, after the success of The Devil, The Darts on the Water, the critical and commercial success of The Devil, The Darts on the Water, um, I got good advances for my first two novels. But even then, you know, I, I, I made it. It, it was fantastic because it gave me the time I needed to write them. I always had to do something else. And first of all, it was TV. I made TV documentaries in between times. Um, but TV takes so much out of you. It's not a very, it doesn't sit well with trying to be a writer. Um, and then I, uh, I, would, I would do reviews and things like that. Um, a big shock to me, and the thing that changed my entire approach to my career was sitting on the board of the Royal Literary Fund. I don't mean the board, I mean the advisory committee of the Royal Literary Fund. The Royal Literary Fund is a wonderful organisation that was set up using um, the money left by A.A. A. Milne from the royalties of Winnie the Pooh, and they have a very significant endowment. And A.A. A. Milne said that this, the money was for writers in distress. And when I, we used to sit gather together once every other month um, and we would go through letters um, usually about writers. It was usually somebody else, like the agent or neighbour or a family member or a friend who would write and say this person is struggling. Um, but sometimes it was the writer themselves. And after an assessment of their situation, we would then make an appropriate grant or give them a pension. Um, and reading these letters was so shocking. It was so shocking that some very eminent writers had ended up penniless and their widows typically, uh, it was widows, not widowers, had ended up, you know, um, begging uh, effectively uh, for help. Um, really shocked me. And there were, 
you know, there were, there were several household names that came across our desk at that point. And I thought something is seriously amiss with this industry. Um, you know, and with, you know, I had my I had my suspicions anyway by the fact that you know I would spend years working on a book and, and end up with ten percent of the royalties. And although I was I would be assured by publishers that well you know it takes a lot to bring a book to press and we're bearing the cost and the risk and all of this, you know, I still kind of felt fundamentally wrong. <laughs> Just, <laughs> I mean, I'm no accountant, but there was something about the math that never quite added up to me. So after I sat on the board of the Royal Literary Fund for a while, I thought, I have to get a job. And, um, you know, I have to have some more security than writing. Um, and happily, uh, I don't know whether you just put the vibes into the uh, atmosphere. But anyway, I got off the visiting professorship in America to Williams College. And I went twice, once in 2011 and once in 2013 for a semester each time. And I realized that teaching was something that I could do alongside writing. You know, I could teach one day and write another day, whereas I just can't make TV and write on another day. It's TV so all consuming. And the way the industry is, you know, you're working with these kind of type A people who just won't leave you alone. But writing, you can actually package, you know, and especially teaching an American university because you teach a course, you're responsible for your course, that's it, right, as long as you don't get drawn into administration. Um, so I, you know, I, I did two semesters at Williams College and then I was then invited to apply for a position at Georgetown, another visiting position, um, and that, so I took that. We came in 2015, my husband and my son and I, and actually, you know, that visit has sort of gone on and on and on. And I've now, you know, I, I was chair of the Lannan Centre. I'm now director of the Lannan Centre. Um, admin doesn't sit quite so well with writing novels as um, teaching does, but I have a lot of freedom in this job, and it was designed for a writer. You know, it was designed you know, for somebody who worked in the world of writing and produced their own writing. And the person who held it before me was Carolyn Forche, who was one of America's most eminent poets, um, actually just nominated for a Pulitzer. So um, those sorts of positions exist in the United States in a way that they don't exist in Britain. There are creative writing positions in Britain, but... but um, Creative writing doesn't receive the sort of help and largesse that it does in the United States. You know, there are philanthropists who are genu genuinely interested in writing and writers. Uh, we don't have a history of that in Britain. And we also, at the same time, don't have the kind of state support that writers in Germany get. We writers in Germany get a salary from the state. <laughs> so, um, I think it's Germany. I mean, girls, I mean, will do their research and correct me, but it's certainly, I think it's Germany, but it's certainly one of the Northern European countries where they actually get a salary from the state. So uh, Britain does none of that. Britain, I think, relied on class. It just relied on private incomes uh, to pay writers, but that's not possible for, for, for most of us. So here I am in the United States, where it, which is you know, where I've been able to make it work. And then in the United States as well, uh, I don't mind being candid, you know, there's a fantastic speaking circuit so i make um i make more money from speaking than i do from writing well we've come up against our time limit um oh we're, gonna, we're ending on the financial note are we <laughs> i know i can i can i can i can add another question in if you want <laughs> well I, I mean i will only say this it is a, it is a career of such precariousness that you know any time someone says that their kid wants to be a writer and would i talk to them you know, I, I find myself sounding like my mother and sounding like all the career advisors I had who were, oh, you know, well. <laughs> I was going to say, it's like your career advisor who said, um, are you sure you want to be a writer? You can't really make a living from that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it's worked out, you know, but, but writing becomes part of, it becomes one brick in the, in the war of your literary career. I have a literary career. But my career as a writer is not something I could live on. Well, look, Aminata, thank you for being a fantastic guest on Always Take Notes and taking us through all your, your varied projects and wishing you uh, best of luck with everything going forward. Thank you very much, Simon. Thank you very much, Rachel. That was the Always Take Notes interview with Aminata Fauna. 
you can follow her on Twitter at Amanata Fauna. She has a website, amanatafauna.com. And her latest book, The Window Seat, Notes from a Life in Motion, is published by Black Cat. Hello, it's us again. Simon, what was your main takeaway from the interview with Amanata? I really enjoyed talking to her um, because I'd come across her work uh, when I when I worked in Sierra Leone some time ago. So I was familiar both with the place she was writing about and and certainly with The Devil That Dance on the Water. So really interesting to talk to her. I was also struck by this decision that she'd made to to take a university job essentially to kind of put herself on a on a sound financial position and also to move to the US so kind of how she had managed her career as well as the book she'd written what about you Mm, sort of a running theme with a lot of our interviews as well as the importance of having teaching and the flexibility that affords I thought it was a particularly rich uh, discussion of writing in different mediums and and obviously as journalists we both found it interesting um, her view that journalism is you know reductionist and prefers simplicity um and it, and it's true affords those nuances and those kind of inner life uh the probing of people's inner lives in a way that that journalism doesn't as a as a writing form um so i thought that was fascinating um and i would tend to agree um what have you been working on simon um i have been uh working on this proposal actually for a new book and um moving the my various magazine assignments forward but i mean i've kind of spent spent the last few days glued to the afghanistan coverage uh really having um you know written this book about the army and and just been and this would be just been kind of felt interesting and a bit strange that that war which which began when i was 16 and has kind of covered so much of my life and i wrote this book about it that it's all come to an end in such a way so it's been i think yeah i don't kind of know my know my feelings about that but it's, it's been um dominating my thoughts really really of late um and yeah just I, I'm kind of I, t- I took holiday earlier in the summer, so I'm just plowing on with work really through August, trying to get a bunch of stuff done, which I quite like because the uh, because a lot of people are away. I feel I'm sort of getting like less interrupted and can move on with stuff. Um, what about you? I'm one of those people fleeing the country in August. No, um, I am doing the final bits of uh, you know bits and pieces, interviews and stuff for a essayish thing on Simone de Beauvoir. Uh, her last novel is coming out at the beginning of September. So hoping to file something good <laughs> on that. Um, but yeah, other than that, getting ready to go away for a week, compiling some reading. So if any listeners have anything they think I should be reading, let me know. This has been uh, Always Take Notes, hosted by me, Simon Aikham. And me, Rachel Lloyd. Our producer and social media editor is Artemis Irvin. Our graphic design is by James Edgar and our score is by Jess Van Heiser. If you'd like to follow us on social media, you can find us on Facebook and Instagram at Always Take Notes, on Twitter at Take Notes Always. Our Patreon page is under Always Take Notes. And if you'd like to leave a review on iTunes or get in touch with us, please do. Many thanks. Goodbye.